Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Biting Into Healthcare with me, Dr. Miguel Stanley. Today, for the very first time, we are going to have an interview. I promised you at the very beginning that uh, when I saw fit to interview people that I found fascinating and interesting uh, along the lines of the ideas of what Biting Into Healthcare was all about, uh, that I would bring them on. And today, we've got Dr. Dirk Dudek from Germany, and I'm going to let him introduce yourself. Dirk, who are you? What do you do? What are you about? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. Great pleasure and an honor to be one of your first guests at this uh, beautiful new podcast. Um, yeah, um, I'm a dentist, as uh, I suppose most of your listeners. Um, uh, and I do implants for many, many years. I worked for in total for 14 years in university clinics. So I've seen all these cases and I see all uh, many, many disappointed patients. I see uh, uh, young students uh, wanting to uh, drill a hole in the bone as fast as possible. So I get all these, um, the big picture of implantology over the years. And um, when I started to think about um, the quality of dental implants. Uh, actually, I was looking for it uh, um, for my doctoral thesis for a topic. Uh, we selected uh, in 2011 or so, we selected uh, just 23 implants from the market, steroid package. And to that date, I had very, very little information about scanning electron microscope and all these techniques. So. Uh, I started looking for answers and um, what I received are more and more question marks because what we saw in the electron microscope was uh, that really made my blood run cold because there was, there was a sterile, not one, there were many sterile packaged dental medical devices ready to use for my patients showing significant contaminants. And this was if I look back on the years, I see this is the moment where I opened Pandora's box. So um, by finding out these um, contaminants or impurities or remnants from the production, um, I'm, I dived into this topic more and more. And uh, over the years, I'm, uh, I performed uh, in my group uh, actually four studies and we collect now every two to three years, a hundred implants from the market, randomly selected by blind shopping or companies uh, just sending us their samples. And um, there is, to cut a long story short, there is one thing that really concerns me is over the years, I expected that everything is going to be a bit better. So an improvement in, because companies, no, they were informed about um, different, um, um, some, some lacks of quality or quality management. And I assume that everything is better now. So if you compare a car 10 years ago, or the car industry is building cars, and you see the car today, like electric, anything is new, there was no, actually no uh, improvement. I could check over the years, I could see over the years in the in these um, uh, uh, random testings of dental implants. And um, by by um, all these numbers in total, I've seen more than 300 dental implants. So this was a lot of work in the 300 types of uh, 300 brands of implants. There's 300 types from 200 brands. So there are, I think I've seen 95% of companies who are uh, companies who represent 95% of the market. There are lots of Italian garage fabrication size or tiny, tiny fabric. And so, what you and what you did, what you discovered led you to create the Clean Implant Foundation. So explain a little bit of that and then we'll get into yeah. Depth. So please, if you're listening to this, it's going to be a long conversation. Okay. And, uh, it's got a lot of surprises uh, and we'll get into it. So stay tuned. So continue. So then what did you do? You, you decided that more people had to know about this and you created the foundation. So tell us about that process. There were actually two moments I, I can remember very, very well. The one was um, in San Diego um, where we, I was invited to speak for the ICOI um, uh, group. Um, 
huge congress, um, 1,200 American, mainly American dentists. And I was just showing the, presenting the failure of EU device regulation by all these um, implants, um, or let's say the, the, the number of implants, the shocking number of implants that received a CE mark and were on the market, ready to use for patients. And I could very well remember the moment when I, I um, as, a, as, a, as a lecturer, you know yourself, you have a, you, you listen, you see your audience. Is the, are you losing the contact to the audience? Is some other, do you, do you have their, 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 um, uh, their awareness? And, and I saw that some guys uh, took out their mobile phone and they seemed not to care about the failing of EU device regulation because we are in the US. And I was very, very prepared on this huge screen, uh, 10 meters in, 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 width, in length. Um, I, the next images um, I had to show were images of, SEM images of uh, implants that were made in USA. So I asked my audience very polite uh, if they could uh, just um, give me one more minute of their attention and then they might use, anybody can use their mobile phone. And I showed on this huge screen um, implants that uh, presented a significant contamination. And I said, sorry guys, they are all made, these pictures here in implants on the American soil. So um, at that moment, you could hear a needle fall. I still remember that people far in the, in the, in the darks of the room, you could see just kicking their neighbor saying, watch out, look this. So this was really the moment when I, when I presented something new. Nobody expected um, a quality of a medical device that looks like this in the scanning electron microscope. Well, I, I, remember, I remember when I first heard about what you were doing. Uh, I would say also 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, you know, there's there's these moments, like you said, in your career where where just in life where you learn something that all of a sudden it puts a massive question mark in everything you've been doing. You know, and um, it's like just things that you you didn't think about before. So for the listeners, because we also have listeners that are not dentists. Okay. Uh, for the listeners, uh, explain to me what what should usually happen with the dental implant so the best of my knowledge the way that i would say this is a dental implant is a medical device made of titanium usually titanium with or without an alloy that can and cannot have a special coating for faster integration there's a multitude of different designs there's over, as you said, 200 different brands. I would even suggest way more than that, but 200, let's say, very good brands. And these are packaged in a sterile packaging. Uh, they undergo gamma ray sterilization and they get CE or FDA certification for the use in humans. That the dental implant industry produces hundreds of millions of implants a year. They've been around for over 40 years. Uh, they are gold standard procedure in any dental practice around the globe. And what they do is they get placed in the human bone. So in the, in the jaw in the maxilla or the mandible. And after a certain period of time, they can then support a tooth or a denture or what have you. So as a dentist that was trained in the late nineties, classically trained out of the Branamark school, uh, you know, Bertil Freiburg, Mariano Sanz were my professors, and I was, you know, an early adopter of implants, and I've been very fortunate to have lectured all over the world. I, it never crossed my mind that this was a subject or a topic, because we were always told that they were sterilized. So what are, what are you talking about? What is it that you've seen? Are these implants, are you saying that they're not sterilized? What is it you're saying for our audience? Break it down simply. What is it that you found? Um, that was a quite precise description um, regarding the dental implants. The thing I had to learn, and I, I assume even some, some professionals 
um, think that sterile is the same as clean. There are the same idiom for the same situation. However, it's not. You can sterilize remnants as well. So ster sterile means without any living bacteria, any any um, material. You, you, you cannot um, clean an implant by sterilization. It's a process before. So what you're saying is that, for example, I can sterilize a dirty knife. It will not have bacteria, fungus, and virus or protozoas on it, which are the, the, the scary pathogens that can lead to infection. But the dirt is still on the knife, correct? Yeah, let's call it the foreign, the foreign material that okay. is not... So I, I've understood. So things that shouldn't be there, that the manufacturer is saying, well, that shouldn't be there. So we are as dentists, and r remember, as dentists, and every dentist listening to this, a company tells us, hey, this implant is good for use in humans. It's, you know, class grade four titanium. It's sterilized, and it's a really good... And I'd never thought about this before. So nobody's talking about clean. So define what kind of things are you seeing with your scanning microscope on the surface of these implants that shouldn't be there? Um, first of all, there is to date no definition uh, other than our guideline about the cleanliness of medical devices. There is still an ISO, a new DEAN ISO norm in, pro in progress. It's on hold because it's very difficult to have a definition. What is okay for a medical device to be inside the body of our patients and what is not okay? Is it amount, is it toxicity, whatever? What I find on dental implants in the scanning electron microscope are particles, let's say from a size uh, of, of nearly one millimeter to down to, um, let's say 500 nanometers. So half of a micron what we can see by, by the uh, technical equipment. The thing is that the smaller the particles are, the more they might interfere with the body. The threshold is about for a macrophage cells that, let's say, try to clean the-, right, the from our immune system. So these macrophages yeah. from our immune cells that let's say so, if I cut myself and germs get inside and dirt gets inside my exactly. arm. The police, or the, the cleaning woman, the, 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 yeah, the, the cleaning staff. So these the particles. Body. And, and they, they uh, can um, uh, eat up, or phag by phagocytosis is the word, these um, particles um, smaller than 8 to 10 micron. So anything smaller than 10 micron might be, become part of the body. Okay, so this is if it loses contact to the implant, and I, we we assume in our group that by uh, you just um, from the process of implantation you you just um, uh, drill a hole in the bone and you have a screw that fits into the uh, into this uh, compartment, and there are some forces uh, um, between the bone and the material, and this these forces are. Uh, uh, friction forces up to 70 newton centimeters, that is the value, um, they, these particles may lose contact to the implant. So then we have something in, inside the bone uh, that is not... And is it what? Is it dust? Is it dust? Is it dirt? Is it hair? Yeah. What is it? What do you think? It, what, is it that you're, what is it you're seeing? It's not dust because implants are, uh, uh, um, are packaged in clean rooms. So these are nearly dust-free rooms, particle-free rooms. What we could see is a, a variety of um, um, particles or uh, even some films, film-like. We see thick particles, thin particles. They are made of what we, because we can measure the elements they are made of. And we can measure with another technique the the substance that they are they come from. So, on the one hand, we see the the elements like like carbon, like tin, copper, chromium, nickel, tungsten. Right, right. So all yeah. of the all of these things that are well known to cause allergies in some people, and some people are highly intolerant to these particles. And you know, like if somebody has a peanut allergy, they they can get very sick, right? So. 
what we're saying is a person who has a peanut allergy knows to stay away from peanuts, right? And even in some flights, they will ban peanuts on the flight because one person can't even inhale peanut particles. And we know for a fact that there's a lot of people that are sensitive to these like nickel and all of that, right? And we're not telling our patients that this is a possibility. And what you're saying is that there's these particles that fall on the implant during the packaging phase somehow. Not only packaging, it's um, remnants from the production, from the turning process. Um, if Got it's it. a metal Got implant, it. Um, uh, even remnants of the cleaning um, material itself. For example, uh, it's a long word, it's dodecyl benzinsulfonic acid. This is what's one of the most surprises I had is DBSA. DBSA is a surf actin, a very aggressive cleaning liquid where the interfactory get rid of all the oils from the turning. Got it. If you have these- Like a detergent. It, it's a detergent. Um, and it's a surf actant. That means that this is reacting to cells by rated by the American uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA is a hazardous substance. So what the heck I thought has a hazardous substance or something that is classified by the EPA as a hazardous substance to do on a dental implant that uh, is my res responsibility uh, to put it in the bone of my patients who's, trust, who's trusting in my decision. So this is one of the most, let's say, delicate cases, this DBSA thing. We found out by using a special technique, it's called time of flight secondary EN mass spectrometry, better known as TOF SIMS, where the machine to check it is just well, some two or three million euros in investment. So we, even we go there and all the laboratory work very important, we, we uh, perform is always um, controlled by external uh, official bodies. So like, like not bodies, bodies. Like, so it's like not the, biased. So there's this there's, there's double control. It's, it's neutral, not, it's okay. controlled. Yeah, by the, in our case, by the German accreditation body, DAKKS. So uh, everything we do is, is on a, on a on the research we depend on is, is on a very different level than in any university where they have a scanning electron microscope on the cellar. So it's a different kind of research we do and because- you're not, doing we, this, you're not doing this for any organization. You're only doing this out of, well, it started out of your own curiosity and you're only doing this as part of your foundation the foundation for the Clean Implant Foundation, correct? So that's actually, we, are, we, we have, um, there is a lab, the laboratory is the Medical Materials Research Institute. Got it. I founded this institute because I couldn't find anyone to do it. Yeah. Do it on the way we needed to have these um, mapping images. So, so just let's get back to the discussion. So what you're yeah. saying is during the man, because I've visited implant factories, I've seen them, they're awesome, it's incredible. And yeah. to be clear, dental implants are a major player in you know helping people get their smile back, their integrity back, their you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I've placed thousands and thousands of implants in my career. Um, and so what you're saying is that is in, during the manufacturing process, there are particles and products used to, in the manufacturing of this implant that are not completely washed off prior to the sterilization and packaging. Is that what you're saying? It's uh, a part of the story. The, the, the production of a dental implant, that is the reason why it's, it's, uh, uh, some, it costs some more than, than 10 euros or $10. It's, it's a very complicated and, and, and it's a process that is usually well controlled. It starts, just to have a, a picture of this, it starts with a raw material. It's either titanium, titanium alloy or zirconia, the white ceramic material. Um, and then there's either a turning process of the metal or it's something like uh, the, the, the um, construction of this uh, zirconia implant, different, different ways to come to the final form of the implant. Usually, let's say on, based on the titanium implants, they have a more rough surface and the process of surface roughening is done by blasting process or by anodic oxidation, so some chemical or, or mechanical uh, treatment. Um, so it starts with a blasting process. When you have the blasting material um, that is not only based on um, aluminum oxide, for example, or if you have some contamination in the blasting material, this 
particles may stick into the quite, it's, it's comparison to the blasting material, the titanium is quite soft. So it looks like a, in the morning, if you have a piece of Gouda cheese and you have some crumbles of bread inside the cheese. Got it. And this, and this just, just to keep our listeners on track, what this does is this can, this can cause an immune response, a negative immune response, because our body doesn't have the tools that we're not equipped with the tools to deal with these contaminants. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's, it's, the story is a bit more complicated. Uh, for example, the blasting material usually is either washed away, uh, taken away by acid etching. Uh, but if you use, for example, we had a, a very interesting case uh, where we found hundreds of particles next to aluminum oxide, which is not a big deal because it's a ceramic material, aluminum oxide. We don't speak about aluminum, but we had additional particles containing iron, chromium, and nickel. So these were stainless steel remnants in the surface of the implant. And the manufacturer told us, not a big deal. I'm selling a million implants a year. What is your problem? My problem that you don't have a declaration of uh, particles containing iron, nickel, and chromium on the implant because it should be in the paperwork of the implant itself. So this is- Why don't they do that? I can only assume that it's just for refurbished i don't know it's a it's it's a um, maybe they use refurbished plastic material no no no, no 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 why do you material. what you're saying is is that you've just to be clear if any implant companies listening that we're not going to mention any brands or anything like that uh, uh i don't think you're out here to to damage anybody i think you're actually doing a great work you know and i'm a big fan of what you're doing and many Our glasses have full you're right not have empty we concentrate let's give those a stage who, who so, have a good quality so my, my my question is is are you telling me that you've, you know, you discovered these products and you said you went to a company and you said, Hey guys, you've got this on your surface. Uh, perhaps you should let your medical community that buy your implants know about this so they can at least give an, a better informed consent to their patients that might not want that risk. Are, are you saying that you've informed companies and they have done nothing about it? Even worse, I would love to tell this story, the reaction on some companies a bit later, because this is really where it's getting interesting now. Maybe we could give this point in, yeah, in okay. mind. I would love to, and to answer the question. It starts with a blasting material. The first, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, process where there might be something that is not quite correct or not as intended. Then there is a um, uh, all this uh, cleaning process. Sometimes we have etching, and, and so some chemical cleaning processes uh, uh, after the um, uh, initial blasting process. Or you have an, a different chemical uh, procedure like anodic oxidation, whatever. Then you have the final product. Then you, some uh, these these uh, obviously in the factory these ladies with their with their googles on and they check with a microscope with a light microscope is everything is fine so they have to handle every piece then it's coming into a final cleaning process and then it's going to be packaged so the process of handling is in addition to the process of manufacturing and in the final process of packaging so we have producing handling packaging. We see even remnants from the handling. We see remnants and traces from the packaging. So there are many, many, let's say, sources of a contaminant, of a contaminant on a dental implant. And sometimes it's more a detective work when companies ask us, okay, we don't want to have this um, contam um, pollutant on the implant. Any idea where it comes from? Maybe you can help us. And so some companies really are keen to, to uh, get rid of this problem. They try to solve it. They use our sources and our experience That's great. To, to have a, finally an improvement in their, in their manufacturing. And this is why the days I really love my work because uh, this leads to a better product and in the end to a better quality of medical so, devices overall. Just, so just to break this down again, um, for over 40 years, hundreds of millions of dental implants have been placed with loving dentists into the jaws and mouths of their patients to help them restore their smiles, their chewing function, so on and so forth. Uh, we're always trained that there's a higher or lesser degree of failure of some implants. Of course, it's case sensitive, technique sensitive. 
But, you know, I remember uh, Carl Misch, uh, uh, who's no longer with us, teaching us, you know, that an average of 4% failure rate was normal, was acceptable. And, you know, to be fair, medicine is a work in progress. Medical science is a work in progress. And I think, you know, it, things that we did 100 years ago as surgeons, you know, we're no longer doing today. And, and you know, just 20 years ago, there were things we were doing in dentistry that we're not doing today either, you know. So we're, we're continuously progressing as a, as a profession. But one of the things that I think is important is that if you learn something that can benefit ultimately your patient and the, and the medical community, you have to act on that. If you, if you are made aware that there's something that might be going wrong with the way that things were, were done with the status quo, and you'd be made aware of that and you do not take action. I mean, look what's happening now with Johnson & Johnson. Apparently they're, they're made baby powder, talcum powder that had carcinogens in it. Are you yes. aware of that right now? Asbestos. It's Asbestos fibers. Okay. So in baby powder, 38,000 lawsuits have been filed against Johnson & Johnson. This Classic. is currently going, yeah. we're now, we're now, uh, today's the 18th of February, 2022. Let's just put a timestamp on this. Uh, this is currently a trending news, you know, and I mean, this is a company, it's baby powder. Every commercial they have is like, oh, we love your babies. Trust your babies with us. Trust your babies with us. And what the hell is that product doing anywhere near baby powder? You understand what I'm saying? So I'm certain that a lot of people now are uncomfortable. This is going to cause a lot of stress and anxiety. But the end result, hopefully moving forward, is that not only Johnson & Johnson, but all other companies that make baby powder will not have that product anywhere near um, uh, babies, correct? So I think what's happening with the work that you're doing is that, you know, you began in the last few years bringing to the attention to manufacturers that, hey guys, uh, not all of them, because let's just be clear, some companies have straight away, they get your certification, right? They're, they're, they come out of, the, of your test and they're clean, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of players in dentistry today that are doing the right thing. They, they're, they're, there's what they say, what they're saying and what they're selling is actually true. And you've done that. But there's also some players in implant dentistry where you locate these uh, uh, particles, these, let's say these dirt particles, these contaminants that should not be there. You've told them about this and they have taken positive action in improving the workflow, correct? So that's a correct. good thing. Correct. But mm -hmm. then there's the darker side, which are companies that are made aware of this and choose to ignore these findings, correct? And that is the frustration of you, myself, and all of the ambassadors of the Clean Implant Foundation. So uh, full disclosure, I am an honorary volunteer ambassador uh, I get no uh, payment, nothing. And uh, Dirk, a few years ago, put this on the spotlight of a few dentists around the world that place a lot of implants. And uh, we all kind of committed to helping Dirk uh, reach his ultimate goal, which is to, you know, make sure that this is standard practice. Um, and uh, right now, to the best of my knowledge, Dirk, you're the only organization in the world doing this, correct? I haven't seen something like this on this scale. We are checking implants uh, in no other country. Why, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think there's not more companies? Do, why do you think there's no corporate governance or due diligence? Or how do you think that's possible? I mean, why, is nobody look, why did nobody look for this before? Mm, to be to be honest and clear, there is a, a, um, there is a process for medical devices um that is being checked so so the final product usually pass some controls uh it's not that easy to receive an fda clearance it's not that easy to receive the ce label however what we find is a let's say in the end of the day a failing of this control maybe initially every implant that that has a ce mark or has an fda clearance showed some good results good paperwork and um, over the years, we see a lack of control. It seems that some companies, assuming they have 
once produced a beautiful implant and very clean, fine, and as, as promised um, and, and shown in the papers, maybe they have uh, inconsistencies in their quality management somehow. So over the years, it's, it's not that I find one or two bad apples in the basket. It's, it's, it's one in three implants that showed significant uh, uh, numbers of these tiny particles that, that that's not good there. that's not good so let's just pivot very quickly what are major health concerns for the patient i've got implants in my mouth all right mm -hmm. so what are the major health concerns that could arise from having these kind of implants placed in a, 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 an unwilling patient or a patient that that isn't made aware of this like do you have a list of like five things that could happen with these implants mm. immune disorders there is we have to go back to basic biology by the way i studied biology before i studied med dental medicine um the, you have to understand that every foreign body even an implant is a foreign body for the bone but it's accepted because it has a kind of bio inert uh, surface any foreign body leads to a foreign body reaction so this is attracting foreign body giant cells. So we see that is a reaction on any particle in the bone that uh, in, in the blood that should be there. So this is how, how, we, how the human body uh, is surviving and we live more than, than 50 years. So in average. So the, 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 the problem is that to a certain amount, there is a reaction on any contaminant on any pollutant on any remnant from the production um, in the patient. But there is no, let's say, technical threshold that some guy said to me, well, even you can, maybe you can use a rusty nail if it's sterile in a 20 year old basketball player. Everything even might also integrate theoretically. But our threshold, our, the bar for a, for a dental professional is always the weakest patients who can ever enter his practice. The material we are using should be uh, as good to be used for the, for the weakest or for the patient that has uh, uh, unfavorable uh, clinical preconditions. So we need at least something that, that does not um, um, produce a, uh, uh, an immune answer to the body that is not controlled. So also integration for the definition that say the, the, the integration of the implant in the bone and that it works so fine over the years and we have so many good results with implants is a controlled foreign body reaction. The body can deal with it and it also integrates it. The implant gets kind of part of the bone, that is the definition. And uh, um, without any, any um, um, let's say, dramatic um, foreign reaction or immune, immune reaction. However, these additional particles that have no, that should be, that should never be on a, on a, on a sterile medical device, um, they lead to a certain amount of reaction. And there's a nice definition from Thomas Albertson a good friend of mine and one of our scientific members of the scientific advisory board, uh, he had the definition of an individual foreign body equilibrium. That means this is this one snowflake that breaks the tree. This is there is there is no technical threshold where how, how you can say twenty particles are okay or fifty particles are okay because we have to deal with biology. Biology is is. We have uh, old patients, young patients. We have uh, patients with uh, uh, diseases uh, beforehand. So uh, there are, um, we have no, to date, we have no proof that a, a certain amount or a certain material leads to a certain reaction. What we see, on the other hand, is a skyrocketing number of FDA reported failures of dental implant and um define skyrocketing like what 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 kind of number are we talking about um Do you have those numbers i have this uh i don't want to I think more than 1.3 million reports of failed implants over the years so and there's something and, hmm? and recently i saw you on a tv show in america 
And that got uh, a lot of views. I watched it myself. I was like, I, I was watching YouTube and I'm all of a sudden I'm like, <laughs> what, what are you doing on television? And I watched this documentary. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was quite impressive of a woman that had serious health issues. And somehow, uh, uh, but what, what and I want you to get into that a little bit, but what shocked me was that there was like this hidden back door of complaints on the FDA regarding dental implants that we were led to believe the number was a lot lower. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there is a, a system where companies report failures to the FDA. This is the MAUD system, M-A-U-D-E. I have to see the abbreviation. Um, and and there, there, uh, these data is kind of cryptic information. This very, if you find, if you want to have an information about a, a specific implant and their failure rate, is like a needle in a haystack. You, it's hard to 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 uh, understand the data. And there's a company. It's called Device Events. Um, I'm, I met her um, on on the uh, on online here with the Zoom meeting. And um, a former FDA employee that that uh, let's call it a, a number cruncher or a data analyst, she knows how to uh, interpret the results. And by um, extracting now more and more data from these uh, FDA reported failures, um, lead uh, that that led in the end. Uh, this is quite interesting. A very few months ago, even I think it was end of last year, the FDA for the first time ever. Uh, added to the information on dental implants kind of warning. That means not every implant is 100% safe. Those implant treatment, to, to that date, you wouldn't find any warning about dental implants. However, we are complaining on a high level. We speak about, let's say, in the average between 5 and 50% of cases where an implant gets a... Um, or the patient has to suffer a periimplantitis, that is an infection around the implant in comparison to um, periodontitis. And uh, the, the problem is that um, if, if you ask the companies, they, or if you ask experts, you see always, first of all, it might be the patient that uh, had, a, let's say, a lack of dental hygiene or um, unfavorable clinical preconditions. Um, it or, might be, or, or for example, something that I've been researching a lot, which is FDOJ, fatty degenerative osteomyelitis of the jaw. Which very means, interesting case. Imagine, yeah. you know, imagine about this later. a yeah. dentist takes out a tooth that has a cyst or an infection and doesn't clean the bone properly, you know, at a cheap dentist or whatever. And then, you know, even a year later or two years later, goes to a very good dentist that places a very good implant with your certificate, with everything right. And that can still fail because the residing bone also still had contaminants that the body hadn't managed to clean up. So it's almost like it's a you're doomed to fail no matter what. I mean, the best thing is to never lose a tooth, but to not get sidetracked here, because there's so many steps along the way that can lead to the failure of an implant. You know, smoking, yeah. bad hygiene, okay. uh, low vitamin D. We've did, recently did a study on that. Uh, high cholesterol. Um, the lack of proper cleaning, uh, the bad placement, excessive load, you know, uh, 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 the tooth being high and grinding. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why a very good implant can fail. But what Actually, we're there, there are three three main main. It's a group of three failure groups. So we spoke about the patient. I think it's it's we have to keep this in mind. Then you see and you hear from the industry complaining about a lack of education of the dental profession. True and untrue, depends. So there is for sure, it's not that easy to, to put an implant into the bone in the right way. It's, as suggested by some companies who would have an easy sell, uh, do this, you have a two days uh, training and then you are ready to go for, for doing implantology. Is not that easy. Uh, people, uh, patients should always address experts and, and find out uh, that, that they, there's a certain amount of experience. So we have this group number two, might maybe a lack of education. Or not every dentist can place an implant. Um, but there is a third one, and that is, and this is our topic, and we're concerned. Maybe it's even if it's 10% of all these failures, I don't mind. In the end, as far as we see, so many 
avoidable contaminants and, and, and impurities on a medical, sterile medical device, it could be the material. And this is our focus. The Clean Implant Foundation is focusing on avoidable impurities on dental implants. That's the thing. So what, what I guess, if, 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 to, 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 to sum this up so far, is that you stumbled across in a, your thesis with an electric scanning microscope that one out of three dental implants on the market today, to the best of your, you know, to, to, to the, the ones that you've studied, one out of three have organic and inorganic impurities, let's call them dirt, microscopic dirt on the surface of the implant that have no place inside the human bone marrow and that are not on the label of the implant and that shouldn't be there because the cleaning process did not remove the detergent or the stainless steel from the milling, from the manufacturing process. They are sterilized, but they are still contaminants and that those contaminants could trigger a immune response, a negative immune response in their patients. Now, maybe not all of the patients, maybe not in most of the patients, but there's this a tipping point that if a person has a pre-existing set of health conditions, such as, you know, I don't know, uh, fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis and already has a low threshold for these contaminants or has a DNA, their own DNA is, you know, their, their own immune system is hypersensitive to chrome cobalt or something like that. You know, we all know as dentists, we have patients, mm -hmm. more and more patients saying, take out my chrome cobalt, take out my mercury fillings. The concept of biological dentistry is, which I'm a big fan of, is gaining more traction. That what you're saying is, is that these, this dirt, let's call it that because the opposite of clean is dirty. So these dirty implants um, are contributing, not always, but many times are adding to a person's threshold of immune response. And that if a person has later in life, one of these autoimmune diseases, and to be clear, just look at the numbers in the World Health Organizations. Today, the, the number of autoimmune diseases since 1990 has tripled around the world. There's no argument there. Just recently, uh, in um, I believe I sent this out uh, uh, recently in The Guardian. Um, so The Guardian comes up, here it says, this is dated from the 9th of January, 2022. Global spread of autoimmune disease blamed on Western diet. New DNA research by London-based scientists hopes to find cure for rapidly spreading conditions. More and more people around the world are suffering because their immune systems can no longer tell the difference between healthy cells and in invading microorganisms. Disease defense that once protected them are instead attacking their tissues and organs. Major international research efforts are being made to fight this trend, including an initiative at London's Francis Crick Institute, where two world experts are looking for these things. These conditions, so we have set up separate research groups to help pinpoint the precise cause of autoimmune disease as these conditions are unknown. Number of autoimmune disease cases have begun to increase about 40 years ago in the West, uh, Dr. Lee told the observer. However, we are now seeing some emerging in countries that never had such diseases before. Might it be the implants that are causing this? I'm just saying, 40 mm -hmm. years ago was when we started putting implants in people. I'm, look, I'm asking questions. I'm not, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm not saying it is. I'm just asking questions. We're doctors, we're scientists. We, you know, we're two years into a pandemic. There's still a lot of questions that need to be answered. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to do to help people get healthy. And my mission in life and the, the mission of this podcast, Biting Into Healthcare, is like, man, are we asking the right questions? So the question I'm asking is, could it be that dirty implants is the reason behind this massive unexplained spike in autoimmune immune diseases around the world? And I will answer what I think. We don't know. But what we do know is that there's a bunch of implants out there that have things on them that they shouldn't have. And only True. some of the companies are willing to improve 
And a lot of them said, Shh, we don't want to know. And we're just going to continue because we, our business model is profit alone. And let's face it, if you look at the Johnson & Johnson model that's now got 38,000, they probably knew, probably, allegedly. What I'm trying to say is, is that, yeah. you know, uh, there's a lot of corporations out there that their sole premise is to make money, right? Because shareholders and all of that, and if they have things that are working, why change it? So mm -hmm. do you agree with that statement? Do you think that this is, do you, what do you have to say on that? Uh, I'd like to, to, to uh, mention this, uh, you know, the story about the Mars chocolate bar? Yeah. There was a problem. The, the, the no, Mars no. company uh, in, in 2019, I guess, one German customer found a five millimeter piece of plastic in one Mars chocolate bar. Oh my God. Five millimeter plastic. Mars uh, uh, performed the world largest recall in food history and took away all bounties, Mars sneakers, give it a name. All these from 50 countries, a recall of all these chocolate bars. If we say, on the other hand, if I find something on the implant that is not, has not supposed to be there and there's no declaration that this is okay, why is a mass chocolate bar with a, in comparison, let's say five centimeters in length with a five millimeter piece of plastic more dangerous to the body? I understand. Because this, this is actually leaving the body after two days on average in the natural way. Uh, it doesn't come into the bloodstream, this plastic part. However, if we see contaminants on a dental implant, pollutants, there is no declaration on the, uh, on the dental implant uh, packaging. Is a, is a mass chocolate bar? Is a, is a package of cereals with a warning may contain traces of nuts and peanuts more dangerous than DBSA, or for I give it another example, polyoxymethylene from the packaging, polyacrylic fibers on the of course it, packaging. Of plant. course it's as it's important. Crazy. But my question is, why, why don't people care? Why do you think, because you've been around for a long time, you've been on stage for a long time, you've been sharing this information for a long time. Why do you, what's your answer? I mean, don't all companies improve the quality of their, of their process after you tell them? Let's say the majority does, the majority. The majority, the majority does. Two thirds is okay, I'm fine. Thank, thank God. So what yeah. you're saying is that there's a certain peer pressure for the rest of the industry to follow suit. So, I mean, do you see a trend? Like are there certain nations? I mean, I, it's a difficult question. I, I guess that's, that, that, that's not the right question. I know what you want to ask. There's no pattern of, of uh, country of production of size of company, of reputation of the company, or the price of the implant. There is no, I, I mean, I, I, uh, in other words, I find in significant numbers of avoidable pollutants or remnants on a sterile package implant from companies with good names, with good reputation, with more than 150 euros. And I find even down to 60, 80 euros implants that have a very fine surface. So there is no pattern. They come from good implants from Switzerland, even the, one of the worst implants from Switzerland. So there's no pattern of country or production side. And, and um, how expensive is it for a company to improve their game? I mean, do you think this is, is it like, I mean, a recall Let's, let's just say that the recall is not going to happen. How difficult, like what steps should be taken to improve the cleanliness? Is it like, hey, spend an extra hour washing the implant? Uh, is, have you, do you have steps in play? I mean, have you witnessed what some companies, like give me an example of what a company has to do to improve and then get your trusted seal of approval? Oh, this is two, two different topics. So, so the first thing is, it's not that easy to produce a clean and, in the end, sterile medical device. It's, it's, it's the, the a chain of, of, of different processes that have to, to be very well controlled. And what we see is just a failing of the, or let's say some in, inconsistency in the quality management. Usually you define a process and then you repeat it as it's report, as it's um, 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 in a um, fixed in a report on an SOP in a standard operation procedure, so they have all the paperwork. 
that they have once checked the process and then they go for it. And there's no reason to, to recheck the process of cleaning uh, of the quality management if the outcome is fine. But if some companies then maybe, usually they see it themselves before the implant is leaving the factory, they have quality controls, the QC sign on even on every item you can buy in a, in a supermarket. The quality control usually is, a, is, 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 a, is well functioning. However, in the end, I, they, they don't check any implant with a static scanning electron microscope. I see more than the uh, ladies uh, checking the implants by hand with a light microscope. And uh, for some companies, our um, uh, results were shocking, were uh, interesting, were uh, very uh, received very positively saying, okay, would you mind to visit the factory, tell us what to do, any idea, any clue where, where this might come from? Can you help us on like a detective tracing? Is it the glove that we use? Is it the, 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 the cleaning machine? Is it the automatic system of uh, washing the, the implant? So there are so many tiny steps in, uh, in, in, the, in the whole chain. Um, usually they have a quality management that that is well controlled and and the products uh, and leave the course, factory. Too. And of course, obviously, every the standard, every extra step that has to be implemented. So let's say you've got a company that is not, you know, that has got a dirty implant and you tell them anything that they do um, to improve is going to add to the final cost of the product. And if their product's major asset is the price point, then they're looking at losing a lot of money, right? And that's why most companies that don't want to improve, that's probably the final decision. It's financial, okay? Now, let me ask you a second question. If they implement mm -hmm. these extra steps to improve cleanliness, does it change? Do they have to get extra licenses or uh, 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 would it change their FDA uh, agreement or their CE stamp or is it just something they can do automatically um if they haven't implemented these uh, processes of um let's say a, a, a perfect cleaning pro uh, um, um, procedure then uh, introducing this doesn't affect the uh, let's say it. doing a product better doesn't uh, affect the uh, they don't have to go and get special licensing so any no. company that you have reached out to and say, hi, guys, you know, and I'm sure you do so nicely because you're a nice guy. Say, guys, listen, I've checked your implant. It's dirty. Let's talk. And I'm sure you, are, you do this confidentially <laughs> because I've never seen any negative press around you. So nobody knows. I know you're very ethical about that because you've never told me what companies uh, are dirty. You're very, you're very clean about that. So you're a very positive guy. You only talk about the ones that are good. Um, so these companies, all they have to do is just add an extra few steps in cleaning their implants, despite the extra costs, because they know that that will ultimately benefit the patients and, you know, also protect doctors against potential hazards. Exactly. Because, because at the end of the day, the patient and dentists are also patients. Dentists also have implants in their mouths. You know, I don't know about you. I've got a few in my mouth, but, <laughs> um, okay. you know, we need to, Doctors are good people, man. We want to, you know, it's not all of us want to just make profit. We really want to heal our patients and we believe we're doing the right thing. So here we are trusting a company, buying an implant that's good for our clinic, good for our pocket, good for our community. And, you know, one thing is them not knowing. Other thing is them knowing and not telling us. And that's mm -hmm. a dangerous. Threat. So have you ever been threatened by, with any legal actions by manufacturers of inferior quality implants? Have you ever had any, any stress? Yes. <laughs> want to talk about that a little bit yeah don't mention any names like what well like what, no, what happened? Don't mention the names um so it, it ranges from from very polite an email email from from italy very politely uh please avoid uh, uh speaking about our company and and it might uh it might um affect our good reputation so very politely i think this is implant shows masses of remnants from the blasting nozzle copper and tin tin bronze on the implant so they they just simply said oh but you might to speak a little bit better about us or, or don't mention it four years later i checked the same implant 
I, re I, I gave them the same information and then I received the same email with an additionally, if not, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, take illegal action. So they're trying to zip my mouse to just say, okay, uh, if you ever uh, dare to publish this data, we're gonna sue you. And, and what would they say? What would they sue you with? Like what, that, you, that you've found something? What, what you're, not ask, you're not asking for anything. You're not, I mean, let me ask you a question. I, let's just have this discussion right now. Yeah. So, as, a, as an individual citizen, curious doctor, you go and test an implant, like for example, a patient, let's say a patient with access to a scanning microscope today that listen to this, can grab their implant and say, hey, check this implant. Like for example, uh, I don't think, pa I, don't, I wouldn't know how a patient would go about buying a dental implant, but I'm sure it wouldn't be that difficult. If my patient came to me and said, doctor, let me buy an implant off you to go have it tested prior to you placing it in me. If they covered my cost, I don't think, you know, as long as they, I know they're not going to be placing it into, you know, at home, uh, maybe I'd make them sign a waiver. I don't know if that's legal or not. I'd have to, I'd have to check with my lawyers. But um, any human has a right to go and have that product tested. I mean, it doesn't happen, but it could start happening, right? And if a patient goes and tests that implant from that company you were saying, I don't know which one it is and I don't want to know, but um, they could go to a university and say, listen, I, I'll pay you $10,000 or whatever it costs to have this. How much does it cost to do a, a scanning? Is, that, is, that, is it expensive? Is it like, is it an expensive process? Is it $5,000, $10,000? If you, if, you, if, you, um, if you perform it in, a, in an accredited testing laboratory, it's about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 euros. And then the whole process, let's go $5,000, yeah. the whole thing. Maybe some people, wealthy people that have money would say, look, I want, I'm a bit fanatical. You know, I mm -hmm. don't just want, I don't just want people to tell me my eggs are free range. I want to go look at the farm and make sure those chickens are, damn looking good you know and i'll i will take test samples of the of the earth to make sure there's no pesticides i mean is this there's everybody is allowed to do this so if an individual citizen does this that individual citizen if they're not asking anything from this company and says listen i've discovered this on that implant what is that that's journalism that's like and you know you have citizens can be journalists now especially with facebook and instagram so what leg would that company have to stand on what 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 what's what could they say? Oh, you know, four years ago we were told that our implants were dirty. We didn't take any action. What are they going to say? What do you think they would do? I mean, to the answer to, uh, to, to add something I'm to your curious, story. Like, like, yeah, I mean, it's the oldest thing since um, uh, history. Um, it's very if you have a problem, killing the messenger is the cheapest way. Oh God! To kill the messenger, and this is what I feel. And I hear once, let's say once in a year, I, I receive an email. It, it went so hard that I re received a call. I don't tell the, the country, I don't speak about the country and the company. That he told me, I have. You know what, Doctor Derek? Uh, what you are doing here is is just uh, um, you are killing our company. I said, no, I just told you what how to improve your product. No, I have even cancellation of ordering my uh, people ordering my implants. Um, you should better look behind you and you walk to the streets of Berlin. We have many friends in Berlin say, what do you mean by this? And this was most the first time I ever received a, a threat of, of uh, not legal action here. There's some, some um, like hurting you physical, physical. I'm like, yeah, I mean, this was kind of, wow, is it really that? expensive That's... to improve an implant that they dare to threat me uh, with physical I, I, consequences I, that that is scary and uh, let's just hope that never happens and and I you know I I think that look I'm let's face it if if nobody likes competition to come and eat away their pie nobody likes something that can come and threaten the status quo if you know people I can only imagine the amount of work and money and time and effort it goes into creating an implant. And then finally you get accreditation. Finally, you get a marketplace. You go to the trade shows, you start getting some clients, you got some orders. Finally, you, you know, you're, you're out there and then comes along 
Clean Implant Foundation says, hey, your implants are dirty. You might want to check it out. And then I, I, I can understand why they're getting upset, but it's inevitable that this train has already left the station and it's only, only going to gain momentum. I mean, you have some of the world's best yeah. implant surgeons on you. So do, do, do the companies that, that are positive with you, the good companies, yeah. are they supporting you? Are they, I mean, you're a foundation. What does that mean? Is it a profit? Are yeah. you making profit from this? What's the deal? I'd like to come back to the initial question. How does it come to the idea? And coming back to the San Diego event, because this gives the answer to the question. I might tell a story that's a bit longer. However, um, after the lecture, um, I saw the first time I felt like a rock star. People coming, for, standing up, coming to, to me. I was just leaving the, 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 the stage and, and surrounding me, like 20 people around me. The, the guy uh, um, uh, managing the Congress was complaining, Dr. Dudek, can you please leave the room with your, with your group of uh, discussions maybe outside? Because this was really a rumor after my lecture. And the people were shouting from, from three, uh, they're standing around me and, and from the third row behind said, uh, shouting, ah, oh, Dr. Dudek, what about the company ABC? And I started to give the thumbs up, thumbs down because I remember the data. And at that moment I thought, oh, hell, if, if this goes further, they just, there might be a lawyer in the room. If I do, do a thumbs down simply by remembering some results, this could be dangerous. So I said, okay, guys, stop the discussion here. Ask me one year later, and I give you a precise idea what I think is, is good, is a clean implant. I will find a threshold, I have a definition for it. We will have a consensus with the most renowned professors in the world. And, uh, and then we come back and I, I will show you with one single seal, with one label, that everything is okay on this matter. Just not the quality overall, but the cleanliness of the implant. So this was the, let's say, the, the hour where the, the, the birth date of the idea to, um, to have a foundation. We need something that is, is, uh, cannot be sued so easily. A foundation is, is not that easy because we, we, are, to, um, we are now a, a charitable foundation. Uh, in, in Germany, that was not that th that easy. Um, and uh, finally, we, uh, we we met with um, with Professor Albertson. I give some names: Professor Albertson, Luigi Canolo from Italy, uh, Michael Norton, former president I mentioned before from the AO, um, uh, Florian Boyer from the Charité University, and Vanderberg from Zagrenska University. Um, He's all living legends in their own right. All of them really living legends. And, and uh, I asked them, uh, I, I met Professor Albrechtson in one uh, in Cape Town in a lecture. And he came to me after the lecture said, well, could you, would you mind to, to, to take away the, the black stripes where you, where you hide the, num the names of the brands? I said, if I do so, I'm, I would never come home again because I would be in handcuffs. I don't know. So I was really, I, I know that, I have a delicate, that we have delicate data. And he said, what do you need? I need, I need protection. I need a board that helps us uh, in the definition and, and, and the, in the promoting the awareness that there is a problem. And the solution is a better control of dental implants because we promise our patients that everything is fine. And unknowingly, the majority of dentists using implants, they have no clue that so, about the, the real, the yeah, real what's the uh, quality. What, what's the feedback like from dentists? I mean, you, so, I mean, people can visit your website, which is a cleanimplant.org, correct? Or .com? Both. Both wow. Ways. So cleanimplant.org or cleanimplant.com. And uh, they can find out more about the trusted seal um, and, you know, understand, and it's also patient facing, right? So the public can also visit this website and learn more website, about it. The second website. We have a second website specifically um, the, where the, the content is, is um, less scientific. It is uh, clean implants uh, for you with a numeric for clean implants for you. For you. And um, in German, it's sauberimplantate.de. Um, so, so, how, much, how much encouragement are you getting from the dental community dentists? Like, do you feel that they care? Yeah, because I mean, yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I'm very critical of the dental industry because, um, you know, I've lectured in over 50 countries, as you know, man, I have, I, I've been around for a very long time as a speaker. I'm very curious. I talk to a lot yeah, of dentists yeah. and, 
you know, people go on stage and talk about all this beautiful, 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 and then they go to their real life get practices and they're, you know, they've got the load of the, of a, you know, they work in a, in a DSO network and they've got the insurance companies and they've got, and everybody's sucking out money or the partners or whatever. And at the end of the day, you know, price point is very, very important for so many dentists. And um, I, I'm not saying that dentists don't care, but there's, there's, you know, I created slow dentistry. And if you, you know, I've got a podcast on that here on Biting into Healthcare. We talk about slow dentistry, mm -hmm. which is also a charitable foundation Amazing. Uh, yeah. in Switzerland, uh, telling dentists just to see fewer patients a day with a better degree of safety and quality. So, you know, we're coming from the same place because yeah. I see a lot of dentists see 40 patients a day. I heard in Malaysia, a hundred patients a day. Now, yeah, you can't provide these quality dentists, for 100 patients. Dentists patient don't care about the quality of their implant, right? So, I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's a cultural, sociological, demographic, political, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, conversation about, about ethics at the end of the day, right? I mean, some, yeah, people just, correct. some people just don't care. Some companies just don't care. And that's just, I think, why? I mean, why? I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the ultimate person that needs to demand for this trusted quality seal on their implants is the consumer the right sure so to give um, one idea we have um, um in, in order to give co our colleagues a way to get the information to receive the information about what is what is um awarded with the quality seal i will explain later about the the levels of of, of the thresholds and how, how to receive this quality seal um, we offered them a the status of a certified clean implant certified dentist. So this means these um, these colleagues are well informed about their implants in use. They know, and if it's their decision if they still use an implant, where we have some concerns here at clean implant. But um, by receiving the information and selecting the implant that is um, in the end trustworthy, so it's a trusted quality mark. Um, they can show, first of all, they have a certificate. They can show to their patients, we care for the product we use. We, we don't, Thomas Arbetson once said, we should know and not believe that a medical device says no harm to our patients. So they know that everything is fine and they get in addition um, information material for the waiting room and for the referral practices, if they have some referrals, that implants in use uh, reach a certain level of quality by, you know, when I, when I first saw the, I, years ago, I saw as a, as a hair, hairdresser, I saw a tiny, a tiny information below the mirror. Our scissors uh, are disinfected after every customer. I said, Jesus Christ, what, what? I never thought about this. And this, this guy makes marketing of something that should be totally normal, but it isn't. The idea to, to give to make marketing for a dental practice with knowing I use an implant without any concern in regards to the cleanliness. This is something that works very well. And we have the the, the um, our colleagues can join us for a monthly um, uh, payment. They have a membership and they receive all the data and 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 uh, additional information they need. You know, I uh, I when I started the slow dentistry movement, which I then, you know, gave away to the foundation in Switzerland, uh, I didn't want anybody to think that I was, you know, doing this for me or whatever, you know, I, I, it's, it's weird for some people to understand that, that you can do something that's bigger than yourself. And we have four very basic cornerstones, which, you know, and one of them is room disinfection in between appointments. And we got a lot of doctors saying, I can't believe that you're, you're talking about that. I always do that. I'm like, well, congratulations. Cause guess what? Half the planet doesn't, <laughs> you know, the good people, the good people, the good people are like, but this, yeah. is, this is obvious. And you're like, yeah. well, you need to get out of your comfort zone. Cause the world's a very big place. It is. Yes. And unfortunately there's a lot of bad actors out there that go disguised as good actors and they're not. So I think, you know, what we're looking at here is, uh, when I'm listening, is that implant making implants variate from country to country. Some companies have always been doing it well. And since 2012, you've been scanning implants, discovered that there's some 
things on the implants during the manufacturing process, like detergents and metal shavings and stuff that shouldn't be there. You've let some that could cause immune diseases and autoimmune diseases that could even describe why so many people are getting sick in the last 40 years. Or an implant failure. I mean, that is the obvious. But, you know, I'm actually quite passionate about the immune side of things. You know, I recently yeah. coined a yeah. set. I recently coined the phrase immune dentistry. I have the first hashtag in Facebook and on Instagram. So people can say whatever they want, but that was mine. Uh, and the concept of immune dentistry yeah. uh, is, you know, are the products and things we're doing on people's mouths potentially causing them harm? And I like your snowflake idea. You know, there's a tipping point at certain point that, that you know, that extra snowflake will break the branch. Um, and I think that most autoimmune diseases are uh, caused by lots of little things, diet, lifestyle, many little things, you know, like I have a patient come to my clinic and they're smoking and they're like, oh, I don't know why I'm sick. I'm like, well, you know, quit, <laughs> what about smoking? Yeah. How about quit smoking, you know? Um, but this is an extra little thing that shouldn't be there. And you're letting some companies, you're letting companies know, some say, what can we do to improve, which is excellent. But some yeah. say, ignore you. Some say, we'll sue you. And from what I heard, one or two will even try and hurt you. And others said, how can we help you? And this is where ah, the trust like equality that. mark comes into play. Um, per definition, there's a catalog of criteria. We have to select uh, five implants, um, a maximum of three from the company, a minimum of two directly from the dental colleagues. So we have a random selecting and there is no pre-cleaned implant that was sent to us. So we have always the full truth. All five implants have to match the criteria that is less than 10 particles, smaller than 50 microns. So everything is, you can download all the criteria on our website. Everything is transparent and, and open to everybody. And in addition, there was an idea again from Thomas Albrechtson, as I remember quite well. He said, well, um, the cleanliness is just one thing. How, how can we um, give a quality seal to an implant that it might have failures anyway for different other reasons? Mm -hmm. As we need an additional information about their uh, clinical success rate after two years. So the, we have to check peer reviewed journals, um, publications on uh, and studies that the implant shows a survival rate of more than 95% after two years. So there's a clinical um, data in addition to technical cleanliness, both together uh, um, perform, uh, uh, create this, uh, allow this um, quality to, 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 to carry this quality seal. Do you, and, do you ever, sorry, just, uh, just a quick interjection there. Mm -hmm. Imagine you test an implant. So, so what you're saying is you test an implant, you find something, Yes. You go back and you test again and again, like different samples from different batches. Do you do that? Or is it just yeah. one? No, no, always different batches. So we have a batch spanning quality. We have um, uh, at least it's a 60 to 100 pages report in the end. So it's a huge of data material. And, and uh, in addition, we have to collect the, the, the publications of the uh, system. And then it's not my decision. I take it away. I give it away. Because this decision of thumbs up, thumbs down is no longer just the crazy Dr. Dudek who is inventing this Clean Implant Foundation. We have uh, six, seven, seven uh, professors in our scientific advisory board, and their main duty is a peer review on that data. So the decision is always made by two signatures of two of the board members, and then- That they... sounds science, man. That sounds science. So, so what's stopping you from just publishing everything and- and saying the hell with it, you know, like, I mean, it's kind of like, we started, we started actually. So like, imagine, imagine, you know, I, I, I know for a fact, I, I, like when the pandemic hit, you know, slow dentistry has existed since 2015. We're now in 57 countries. And when the pandemic hit, I was like, oh my God, you know, we did grow 500% because of course clinics wanted to say, we're cleaning properly. And that was, that was uh, one of our finding, founding cornerstones because our founding cornerstones require no technology or training. It's just slow down and do the right thing. Um, 
But with that said, I, I called a, a, a well-known group of clinics in Portugal and I said, I, I was friends with the, well, still am friends with this, the, the, the owner. And I said, listen, you guys should get this certification because I mean, it'd be great for you. There's no DSO model in the country that has this certification. It's usually only single practice, you know, privately owned practices where the dentist is also the owner that, mm -hmm. that has this certification. We still don't have any DSO in slow dentistry. Mm -hmm. And then I, I sat with him. He said, what are the cornerstones? I said, well, rubber dam on all root canals, uh, proper room disinfection, signed valid consent, risks and rewards, and making sure that, you know, the, the all treatments are pain-free. And he said, we just can't do it. He said, we can't, we, we can't afford the turnaround time. We can't afford to put rubber dam on all of our patients. We just don't have the time. I, we would have to raise the prices. And I was shocked. And I just felt like, going on Instagram and telling everybody about this, you know, and it's, it's tough because at the end of the day, if I did that, I would, I would be a, a you know, I'd be an asshole. Bad guy. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd be the bad guy, but at the end of the day, all I wanted to do was to help the consumer. You know, I mean, yeah. you come on, man, you know, and patients when they choose, you know, there's a, some part of the population that can afford the luxury will choose a very good clinic and, you know, with the guy with a lot of mm -hmm. science and, but a lot of a lot of people choose a dentist that is close to home, that is affordable, and that has a good marketing strategy, right? And that their insurance companies covers their treatment, and that's the reason why they choose said dentist. And then a lot of dentists, they're not even the ones that choose the implant brand. Let's be fair; it's the owner of the clinic, you know. And there's a lot of companies where it's the the dentist is just told you have to use that implant. So for the dentist listening to this, make you know, if don't use an implant that is. Uh, that could be harming your patients. And if you do, at least let your patients know. Maybe half your patients won't even care. Let's face my it. Vision, actually, yeah, my, my vision is that uh, dentists care for their products they use because a patient has no clue about the technical features of anything. Don't forget they your won't German. Have an implant. Don't forget your German. I'm, I'm just saying, there's a big world out there. There's, there's a lot of dentists that really don't care. That's my experience. Yeah, I'm okay. But they I, really I, don't the care. The vision they is something the, that... They want the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest they can get. I know, I know. I know. I accept your point. However, um, the, only thing that, the, the only thing that changes the market is pressure. And pressure is always... It's not coming from top down. Uh, no company says, well, we increase our efforts and quality... And we just raise the prices because they see the effect um, that they have less sales. Um, the pressure has to come from not only the patient asking for a good, a good looking for experts and not going to the cheapest uh, dentist around the corner. Um, they, they, uh, I, I wish the dentist is asking their sales representatives for dental implants. Can I just really trust by knowing this implant? Is, is safe or you just show me uh, wonderful brochures of, of this and that. And, and finally, I heard about the implant is uh, in, a, in a specific uh, uh, amount is contaminated or has some, some avoidable pollutants. So the dentist should ask for, this is my, my, my wish that a dentist ask their sales representatives do, can you give me proper information and, and, and fact-based information about the cleanliness of my system? Because I heard this and that. I'm, yeah, I'm very happy that for the last you know, more than a decade, I've only been using clean implants that even before I'd heard about you. So I was like, retroactively, I was like, whoo, you know, <laughs> but, we've all, but we've always been, we've always made. Yes, the, the this is so gesture. important. Listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm recently also using ceramic implants. Um, does this happen with ceramic implants or zirconia implants? Mm, this brings together the question and then answer. Um, you ask, why do we not publish? We published quite recently in the last issue of the uh, Yomi Journal, the Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Implants, uh, there was a story, we had the same question in, the, in, our, in our research group. Um, we um, had a fund from the Swedish uh, foundation of the Swedish king, King Gustav uh, something foundation. Um, so we could buy 25 ceramic implants from the market by blind shopping. Five implant types. Blind, blind shopping. Blind shopping of 25 What's, implants. Sorry, I'm sorry. Five what, is blind, what is blind shopping? Blind shopping is that we just simply order an implant without telling for the purpose. What, what are you? Okay. 
companies thinking we, we ask colleagues uh, of us in, in other countries please order it we refund you we just need the implant so got it the companies didn't have any clue about the 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 the, the testing of the implant so this was the blind shopping process uh, supported by uh, the swedish government and then uh, or the swedish foundation because we made this together with the Gretzky University, Thomas Arvidsson again, and Vandenberg. I mentioned these names because they are so important. They are main key players. The University of Malmö was involved, the University of Charité Berlin, and uh, in Morocco, uh, my dear friend Jafar Mouhi. So <laughs> always the good guys. So we, we uh, had a setup and we wanted to know how are five implants, uh, let's say representing, I think it's about 20, maximum of 20 brands and not so many different brands of ceramic implants. Wanted to know, are they just clean as they are shiny and white? Are they, is white the same as clean? And um, my job was to uh, check uh, um, the cleanliness of the implant and the, the Swedish colleagues check the roughness and everything. And another the colleague in Malmö checked the, 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 the clinical reports. So we have a, a bunch of information then. And the outcome was same, same. From two of these implants uh, showed significant contaminants. One had a, let's say, not intelligent packaging where they implant quite clean from the production. And the moment they squeeze it in a packaging, where well, the packaging is leaving traces of polyexomethylene, polyacryl. The, uh, you put it out because it was squeezed in the rough part of the implant that is um, mentioned to be in the bone, intended to be in the bone later on. So uh, this was, let's say, the problem from the, because every implant has the same packaging. So every implant of this group showed this massive and not single microns or really 100 micron uh, in size, huge fibers of um, these plastic material. I say, if plastic is good for the body, if plastic is good for us integration, I would have read something about it. It's not. And uh, so two out of five showed significant contaminants. So this happens with, it significant. happens with ceramic implants as well. It's uh... ceramic is it, it, they have a different production process, but in the end you can you can do something that it's uh, um, not as good as it's supposed to be for the for the clean it's easier it's easier for so what you're saying is it's easier for ceramic implant to implement changes to clean than it is in titanium, or not. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. If you if you treat an implant because the organic material usually is burned away because they are they are like like every ceramic in an oven and then you have uh, if this implant is leaving the oven they are usually uh, quite clean uh, in terms of organic. Um, organic, by the way, means carbonaceous. This is not something from the from no hair from the manufacturer or no 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 skin particles. Organic means carbonaceous, containing carbon. This is important in some some plastic and all these chemical things. In in uh, in opposite to the uh, inorganic meaning metal metal particles, something like this. So uh, to cut a long story short, ceramic implants are not simply cleaner because they are white. I call it I had an article uh, that well, the, the headline was uh, 50 shades of white. So <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right, man. Um, so uh, anybody can find out more at cleanimplant.org and cleanimplant.com. You also have a really powerful Facebook page uh, with a high number of followers, uh, like even more than some global market leaders in implantology, like Nobel Biocare, for example. It's like Thank you, you a, mentioned this. This is have, really a grassroots movement. And this, this is the one thing that makes me happy. This is someone asking me what's, what's driving you. It's curiosity on the one hand, and it's seeing that our story has an impact and 110k followers to date is even is, you mentioned it's even more than 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 some uh, market leading companies in just two years we are just two years on on, on facebook and on social media and your and, feedback is good you you know you get a lot of support group from doctors and and curious like it's 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 great no you get the feedback has just been yeah, amazing and so um, I, I just, I, I think, you know, it's um, they, whenever you come along with a, with a great idea, first you get criticized, 
then you get, you know, laughed at and then they're like, hang on. And then they start following you and then they start helping you. And thank you. Uh, and exactly. they're going to say they were there all along from the beginning, you know, <laughs> and um, that's I, the way I, the cookie crumbles. Yeah. You know, I, I do hope that more companies, uh, um, you know, even competition to you come up. I do hope that, uh, I mean, I'm maybe not good for you, but um, because it would be a positive sign absolutely. That, that the trend is kicking in. Yes, absolutely. I do hope that the FDA and the CE accreditation actually starts asking you for your idea before they give the FDA and CE clearance on new implants in the market. I think that if anybody has any connections with the CE certification process or the FDA appro approval for any new implants that they would have to, you know, whatever other testing they do good, but they'd also have to have your trusted quality seal, at least, you know, scanning microscope, you know, and the, the scanning microscopy should, should be performed. And moreover, I do hope, you know, uh, I want to just finish with this idea, but, but before that, I do hope that implants come with the warning label if they do have them, you know, like we, we, we have it in food, we have it on tobacco, we have it on beverages, we have it on candies, you know, maybe not candies. I'll be giving a webinar later the, uh, next week with uh, Darren Weiss from the Humble Smile Foundation, another foundation on big sugar and how I believe candies should come with the warning sign because they don't. <laughs> um, I am, I am. But, um, but um, I do think they should come with a warning sign if, you know, and at least, you know, uh, inform, informed consent. I don't care about that, but at least you should know. I think uh, uh, at the end of the day, the dentist and the consumer have the right to know that that company was warned about these contaminants. And so I think a, a stark warning sign or at least a, a message, an urgent message, not a warning, an urgent message to all companies that have not yet taken action, please do so. You know, if you're listening to this, just come on, you know, uh, let's all collaborate together. Let's improve the game. Let's all try and fight for a better thing. And I, I say this on, 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 my, on the stage when I lecture, you know, if you can't make an honest living being ethical, if you can't make a living for your family being ethical, you might want to change profession or shut down your company and do something else because, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, 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 we're living in an age where, you know, you can't be a bad actor anymore. There's way too much. There's way too many clever people out there. And there's way too much information out there. And you can't hide this anymore, you know, so it's coming. And uh, there's a lot of very clever people that have been paying attention to your work, uh, Dirk. And I'm, I'm proud of what you've done. I know how difficult it's been for you and your partner. Uh, big shout out to Barbara and all the work she does. Um, and, and, you know, um, I, I, I know it's not been easy, uh, but I also know some leading organizations around the world, such as the International Academy for Oral Medicine and Toxicology, the IAOMT in America. Yeah. You recently partnered with them. Um, I know that, you know, there's a lot of other organizations, the Digital Dentistry Society, and moreover, right. there's a, more and more growing dental organizations are supporting you and yeah. wanting to share your vision and message, which I see as, as, as a very positive thing, because you can't unhear this information. It's there. And, you know, there's, I guess, in summation, as the article in The Guardian says, you know, there's, there's in the last 40 years, a spike in autoimmune diseases that is, and now more and more appearing in emerging markets where they never had them before. Maybe there might be a correlation between these impurities on the surfaces of dental implants that could be contributing to this problem. And I think collectively as doctors, as physicians, we should all come together and look at this more, more in depth. We owe it to our patients. We owe it to medicine. We owe it to healthcare. You know, we're not just mechanics. And if we stop, if we, if we continue to look at implant dentistry as mechanics and use terms like biological integration, when what we really mean is that the implant, you know, takes to the bone and you can chew on it and there's no infection and visible inflammation, 
But what about the invisible inflammation that can cause cytokine storms through the production of, you know, cytokines that can cause harmful damage to the rest of the body? And we know that if you do have these organic and inorganic impurities, they will trigger uh, an, infl an inflammatory response that you might not even feel, you might not see, but it can cause havoc. And if you have other things going wrong, that havoc tends to build up and could lead to serious autoimmune diseases. So I think, you know, um, all I can say is just thank you for your service. Thank you for your work. I'm really proud that you're my first uh, guest on Biting Into Healthcare. Um, and I do hope that this inspires people uh, to, to, to look up cleanimplant.org and cleanimplant.com uh, and that the consumer can also visit clean implant for you and the mm -hmm. four is the not the digit four is that exactly. a dot com or dot org uh dot com dot com all right and that if any implant manufacturer listening to this has been contacted by you and hasn't made the changes that tries to work collectively to improve i mean look at what happened in asbestos um you know for years we were putting asbestos in everything, thinking it was a great product. And then people started getting sick and there was a lot of denial. No, 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 no. Because changing it was a nightmare. I mean, the cost, the burden, the shutting down of the mines, the shutting down of the processing plants, the shutting down of the factories, all of the jobs that were lost, all of the, everything that just an accepting that, oh my God, what have we done? was a really difficult thing. And that's a historical fact, period. That just it's happened. Still, it's still a nightmare. If you so, see in Berlin, the new houses here, when they're building houses. So, so I'm just saying, you know, man, nobody did this. No company, no implant company thought about this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, because it wasn't part, you know, when Per Invad Brandemark in Sweden and Gothenburg came up with the first implant, this wasn't an issue. People were thinking about integration. It wasn't a discussion. But mm -hmm. now it has to be. We owe it. I mean, look at uh, hip replacement. The joint was in chrome cobalt for many years and people were like getting sick and no, it can't be the chrome cobalt. And it finally opened up the patients and their hip had melted basically and they banned that practice. But there was a long period of time where people thought it was a great product. You know, uh, mercury amalgam fillings. For 100 years, we've been using mercury amalgam fillings and the IOAMT has been fighting that for 33 years. Finally, only last year, FDA uh, came out and said, look, might not be good to use this in children and lactating or, you know, pre uh, pregnant mothers or, uh, you know, and still in some countries like, you know, in the UK or in, around the world, a dentist cannot suggest to remove a mercury amalgam filling. And you start looking into, and the reason is money, you know, it's very expensive to to do that. And at the end of the day, Dirk, I think there's a mea culpa. You know, it's like nobody wants to admit that they've done something to hurt somebody else. Nobody wants to do that. We're, everybody's, a, I really want to believe that we're good at the end of the day. People are good, and especially doctors, you know, deserve all my respect and credit because they've taken time to learn something to help other people. Yes, they, yes there's a few bad actors, but I don't think any dentist out there willingly has ever wanted to harm their patient, ever, ever. All right. Mm -hmm. And we trust, we have to trust the companies because, hey, it's got FDA clearance, CE clearance. All of these implants have CE and FDA clearance, all of them. Yes. Right. Yes. So we have to trust that that is enough. But what we're saying now is that it's not and that there's this extra level of care that has to be done. And uh, we know where we can find it. I know that there's still a lot of work to be done. I know that not all the clean implants, because I believe you said once that there are some companies that are clean, but don't want to pay for the certification. It's okay. So yeah, which is fine. Uh, but you are a nonprofit, um, but um, they should, they definitely should, because Thank I think, you. I think the tide is going to shift. And I know, for example, with my patients, we definitely let them know about the work that you're doing. And we let them know that the implants that we work with are safe and, you know, we're very proud of that to go the extra mile and take the, the time to let them know that. Beautiful. So my friend, um, where is your next meeting? Uh, 
next week actually we will be in the ao meeting in san diego again so oh my god all right that was closing for what everything i will be next week what are the dates uh i think it's from friday next week uh 29th i don't know exactly and that's in chicago right no no this is the great uh, san diego um, san diego in san diego is the ao meeting my God, that I lectured, I lectured, albeit online last year for that. It's a great meeting. I think my friend Howie Gluckman is lecturing there. Uh, Scott Gans will be there. Yeah, so Scott Gans. One of our board members. So we have them all there. And are you lecturing? No, 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 no not me. Uh, my next lecture will be in Seoul, in Korea, in, in May, at the ZDEX uh, conference. So, but you will be with the, with the, with the, at the trade show to tell people about your product? Yes. Are you expecting any stress? Always. <laughs> <laughs> Good know, things that, never come easy, Miguel. Good things yeah, never come easy. Listen, if you if you need any backup, you know you've got uh, some good friends out there. Don't give up. You're on the right path, and at, you know there's a lot of people out there that might be you know that are sick, and maybe this was the missing link. That if they had this information, they might just want to take those implants out. Uh, no disrespect to the design of the implant, the quality of the implant, the quality of the doctor, the quality of the teeth, all of that hard work. But there might be that organic or inorganic impurity on the surface that could be that snowflake that has triggered this autoimmune response. Avoidable. Right? Yeah. And we didn't know. You know, we just didn't know. Now yeah. we know. Maybe we can fix it. That is, that is the uh, uh, one thing I would close this uh, wonderful session. Um, is, is again the citation of uh, Thomas Abelson. We as dentists should know and not simply believe that our implants are clean and have no harm to our patients. So, so uh, this is knowing is better than believing. And knowledge is something we can provide here a clean implant. That's a beautiful really a great way. pleasure to a uh, beautiful to way to end this. I'm Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. And uh, again, the timestamp today is the um, 18th of February, 2022. So if you're listening to this in the future, uh, hope, hopefully more doctors and more companies have, uh, have collaborated with you. So my friend, always a pleasure. Keep on. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, thank you for the inspiration for the cold baths. <laughs> I have been diving into the ocean. The Wim Hof uh, thing. Doing yeah. the Wim Hof thing. And it's amazing. It's an amazing yeah. thing. So uh, stay strong, stay healthy. And we speak soon again, my friend. Likewise. Bye-bye.